Imagine if you can, a glorious time as the 1980s. When the VHS boom was so huge, even a kid growing up in a small mid-Ohio town, population 6,000, could have access to video rentals at nearly a dozen different locations over the course of their childhood. And only one of those was outside the city limits. When you're walking down the video store aisle and you're looking at titles and you realize there's someone next to you, you're like, what do you think? Or they say, you seen this? Suddenly you find uh, a compatriot in the horror movie journey in those video aisles. The nearest blockbuster was 45 minutes away, but that wasn't a problem with so many other places to choose from. Pretty much all of your video needs were covered and not just by dedicated video stores. Sure, those were the places for Maniac Cop, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Dawn of the Dead, and Puppet Master. But you could get Chopping Mall at one grocery store, Knight Riders at another, the Friday the 13th franchise, Child's Play, Rambo 3 at the pharmacies, you could pick up the Evil Dead 2 or Trick or Treat at the gas station, Summer School at the TV repair shop, Slumber Party Massacre 2 and Slaughterhouse at the drive through convenience store. Those truly were the wonder years. It became this routine that every Friday we would go to Blockbuster and I would get to go and I chose solely on the box art of a movie. Um, and I don't remember when Blockbuster started, if it was the late, I don't remember when it was, late 80s or early 90s, whenever that was, but all of the movies that, that I would gravitate to were 80s horror things. I mean, when you would see the box of critters or ghoulies of these things coming out of a toilet, I was like, that. I want that. Occasionally, while on your 80s renting spree, you would come across a movie that had an odd tendency to poke things at the camera. That's because these films were initially released in 3D. And while they weren't 3D on home video, it was kind of charming to see them pointing things at you like this was supposed to blow your mind. So in this episode of 80s Horror Memories, we're going to look back at the movies that tried to impress us by sticking things in our faces. So put on your 3D glasses for absolutely no reason, because just like those VHS rentals, this video is not in the third dimension. And let's talk about the 3D horror in our latest 80s Horror Memories. d has basically been around as long as movie cameras have a patent for a 3d film process had even been filed before the start of the 20th century a 3d movie would be made here and there as decades went on but the hollywood studios weren't really interested in cashing in on this gimmick that changed when the 1950s rolled around and they realized that they had started competing with television how could they get people to go out to see their movies instead of staying home and watching the tube? The answer must be to get the images to jump off the screen and right into the viewer's face, right? This thinking gave us the golden era of 3D. The days when movies like House of Wax, Dial M for Murder, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and many others reached theaters in three dimensions. But that golden era sputtered out in just three years and 3D once again became an oddity. One of the reasons why the 50s 3D boom came to a quick end was because that style of 3D required two film prints to be projected simultaneously. This was a real headache for projectionists. To see the 3D effect, audience members had to wear glasses with colorfully tinted lenses, usually a red filter over one eye and a blue filter over the other. This caused its share of literal headaches for moviegoers. In 1970, a new process called Stereo Vision was invented. This version of 3D only required one film print, and is basically the same kind of 3D that can be seen in theaters all over the world today. The viewers still need to wear glasses to see the 3D effect, but at least you don't have to look at the world through a Mario Bava tint. Still, there wasn't much call for 3D in the 70s. I mean, outside of softcore sex comedies and Andy Warhol movies. Then in 1980, a pair of Xerox salesmen decided to get into filmmaking by producing a Western. 
and they decided that they could draw in viewers by making the film in 3D, a gimmick they figured the modern youth wouldn't be familiar with. Their film, called Comin' At Ya, reached theaters in July of 1981 and was successful enough that it caught the attention of Hollywood and kicked off a 3D resurgence. The first genre filmmaker to cash in on the 3D revival was Charles Band. Which is no surprise, because Band was always on the lookout for the latest entertainment trends. He was one of the pioneers of the video age, having started his own video distribution company in 1978. By the end of the 80s, he would create the genre film company Full Moon, the same company he's still running today. But Full Moon wasn't even a twinkle in Band's eye yet when he decided to make a 3D movie called Parasite. No, not that one and brought in StereoVision creator Chris Condon to supervise production. The 3D effects may have been stunning, but the script Ban had to work with was a real clunker. Parasite drags through its story, feeling much longer than 84 minutes. It's a good thing Ban had things pushing out of the screen at the viewer. That's pretty much the only way to get people to stay awake for the entire duration. Set in the dystopian future of the early 1990s, Parasite follows a scientist who teams up with a lemon grower to destroy the monstrous parasite he created. Blood and slime flows from the screen. A snake strikes, people are tossed directly into the camera during fights, and a toothy parasite lunges out at you. There are a few reasons to watch Parasite beyond the chance to see things getting pushed at the camera. Sherry Curry of The Runaways plays a punk of the apocalypse. Vivian Blaine of Guys and Dolls makes one of her last screen appearances. Demi Moore makes one of her earliest screen appearances as our lemon-growing heroine. Today, she'll tell you this is the worst movie she was ever in. What's the worst movie you've ever been in? Um, it's Parasite in 3D. And the nasty little parasite was created by multiple Oscar-winning effects artist Stan Winston. So Parasite is worth checking out out of curiosity, but don't expect to have much fun with it. Parasite was released in March of 82. The second 3D horror film of the year came along just two months later. It was also from a legendary indie producer, Earl Owensby, who had his own 200-acre studio in North Carolina. Drive-ins of the South were his bread and butter. During the 80s, Owensby produced a series of six 3D movies, starting with Dogs of Hell, also known as Rottweiler. Since Cominacha was filmed in Spain, the poster for Rottweiler claims it was the first 3D movie made in the US since 1953 which isn't accurate even if you take Parasite out of the equation. But that's marketing for you. Dogs of Hell is the most laid-back killer animal movie you could ever see. The military has turned a pack of dogs into vicious killers by way of surgical implants. These dogs are being transported when a fiery crash releases them into the countryside. They go on to kill several people, but the attack scenes show next to nothing. At least we get to see darts thrown into the camera, explosions, and some mud wrestling. Owensby produced another 3D horror movie just two years later, the anthology Tales of the Third Dimension. Hosted by a skeleton and three vulture stooges, it has a bit more going on, packing vampires, grave robbers, and Christmas at grandma's into 90 minutes. The studio finally got into the 3D horror game in August of 82, and this was a big one. The one with the most enduring popularity of any of these releases, Friday the 13th Part 3, which is also the one you're most likely to be able to catch a 3D revival screening of. And if you ever had the chance to see Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D, it's highly recommended that you do so. Director Steve Miner really took advantage of the 3D format, sticking a variety of objects into the screen. A yo-yo, juggled fruit, a lit joint, a couple of eyeballs. 
That's fun, but even better is the added depth the 3D brings to every single moment. It makes the film an immersive experience. You're at the isolated cabin with ill-fated vacationers, with iconic slasher Jason Voorhees wearing a hockey mask for the first time in the franchise, lurking around, waiting to strike, and when he does strike, the murder weapons emerge from the screen. Shooting the film in 3D made things a lot more difficult. For example, the scene where a character gets impaled with a fireplace poker took 36 takes just to get right for the 3D camera, but it was worth it. Thanks to the resources of distributor Paramount Pictures, this was the first 3D movie to receive a wide domestic release, which was another thing that was difficult to pull off. A lot of theaters had to be equipped with the silver screens required to show this kind of 3D and Paramount had to provide the 3D lenses to show it. In the end, they were rewarded when Friday the 13th Part 3 ended up being one of the most successful entries in the franchise, and there was an added bonus. The film was shot using the Marks 3D system, with Martin J. Sadoff on set to supervise the process. It was Sadoff who suggested giving Jason a hockey mask, or at least one of the many people that claimed to have. The year after Friday the 13th Part 3, Universal and Orion Pictures released their own Part 3 horror sequels in 3D. Jaws 3D reached theaters in July, with Amityville 3D following in November. Jaws 3D does have a great cast, with Dennis Quaid, Lou Gossett Jr., Simon McCorkendale, Bess Armstrong, Leah Thompson. It has a cool setup, too. A massive shark swims into a lagoon at a SeaWorld park, 40 feet beneath the surface of the water, and even eat at a restaurant down there. The shark tries to batter its way into those tunnels to munch on the park visitors. A terrifying concept. But Jaws 3D also spends most of its runtime focusing on uninteresting people doing uninteresting things. And the special effects are atrocious. The movie doesn't make a secret of this. One of the first things we see is the shark chopping a fish. The fish's head floats into camera, and it looks terrible. There are a lot more bad effects where that came from, so you might enjoy laughing at these ridiculous things. Most people don't want to go diving with sharks, though, but to see a fake shark emerge from a screen? Now that's entertainment. Since Jaws 3D was a 3D sequel to the film that kicked off summer blockbuster madness, it was a huge success. Amityville 3D didn't fare nearly as well. It was actually the last Amityville movie to get a theatrical release for over 20 years. But it's a serviceable haunted house movie with some creepy moments and a solid cast, including Tony Roberts, Lori Loughlin, Meg Ryan, and Candy Clark whose character deserved a lot better than what she gets from the movie's evil spirits. The 3D effects get more fun as the movie goes on. At first, you get flies, cold air, and steam in your face. Who needs that coming out of a movie screen? We see that stuff enough in our regular lives. But then there's floating, glowing, spiritual ghost stuff too. Corpses reaching and lunging, a swordfish flying through the air, and best of all, a fire-breathing demon. Then the house explodes for no apparent reason. All in all, not a bad time at the movies. The run of 3D horror movies wrapped up in 1984 with the release of Tales of the Third Dimension and a real straggler of a movie, Silent Madness which missed the slasher boom at the start of the decade and was coming in at the end of the 3D resurgence. 
This Halloween knockoff begins with an overcrowded mental hospital, accidentally releasing a criminally insane murderer. He heads back to his hometown and starts stalking a group of sorority girls. He's no Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees, but he racks up a decent body count, dispatching victims with items like a sledgehammer, a hatchet, a crowbar, a drill. There's more steam to put to use as well. Heads are crushed and removed. More notable than the kills in the 3D, though, are some of the cast members. Sidney Lassick from Carrie, Catherine Kami and Paul D'Angelo from Sleepaway Camp, Vivica Linfers from Creepshow, Elizabeth Catan from Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. Every single one of these movies named is better than Silent Madness. But if you're a slasher fan, it's worth a watch. Unfortunately, that's it for 3D 80s horror movies. Several other 3D movies were made during this brief resurgence, but they were of other genres. Sci-fi movies, adventure films, even some comedies. Then 3D just lost its appeal with audiences, and the studios moved on. In 1991, New Line Cinema decided to shoot the climax of Freddy's Dead in 3D. But when they did, it was the same kind of 3D that required the red and blue lenses. Then, in the late 2000s, 3D started making a comeback, minus the red and blue. We got a new 3D slasher with My Bloody Valentine, and the massive success of Avatar made sure that modern 3D was going to stick around. Now it's just a regular part of the movie-going experience. Some screenings are in 3D, some are in 2D, take your pick. But back in the day, 3D was something rare and special. Even if a lot of the movies that used the gimmick weren't memorable otherwise. What do you think of the 80s horror movies that use the 3D gimmick? Did you catch any of these on the big screen when they first released? Or if you were too young at the time, or not born at all, have you seen any of them in 3D at a revival screening? Share your thoughts on these films and any memories you have of them by dropping a comment. We want to know all about your 80s horror memories. On the next episode, we're heading to Santa Mira to peel the mask away and show the guts of what many call the bastard stepchild of Halloween. So prepare for that song to get stuck in your head as we stare into the screen of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Until next time, gore hounds. Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.